Hi guys, welcome back to Wild Vlogs, where we talk about all things wildlife and all things filmmaking. Light, what a subject I picked. You can fill a whole YouTube channel on light, let alone a 10 minute or so vlog. Before we hit that though anymore, I'm going to refer back to the bumblebee you must have just seen there at the start of this vlog. That was a queen bumblebee just emerged I found in my backyard this week. If you find one similar to her, that's a little lethargic, looks like she might need some, some help, then do dilute some sugar in some water and a postage stamp sized piece of kitchen towel soaked in that sugary solution and then offer it up to her and you'll be amazed just how quickly she takes it and how grateful she is she was back on the wing within two to three minutes. Back to light, well the mainstay of today's vlog is going to be clips from my archives and a bit of footage I shot this week and it's really to do with my personal relationship with lights and how I've taken to it creatively. This isn't anything to do with stopping down or stopping up exposure, ISO levels, nothing to do with that at all. This is more about the creative elements of light and my particular personal take on it, which might be interesting to some of you. I will though give you the three main categories of light as I see it, as a cameraman, as a cinema photographer, and of course I'm talking about natural light, that being the sun. There's the acute angle light. When I say acute angle light, I mean 45 degrees or less. Um, I'm talking sunrise and sunset, the golden hours famously. But then also anything up to 45 degrees will afford you that light, that horizontal light that comes towards the subject and lights it up completely from the side, flank on. Um, a beautiful thing to behold. Um, requires making an effort more so in the summertime where you'll be up in the wee small hours uh, and also then later on in the evening less so in the winter time when you tend to get that 45 degrees and less acute angle light pretty much throughout the main part of the day then there's the top down light the harsh light the midday summer sun light now i'm not going to say don't use that light don't go out and venture into that light because i do you saw the pembrokeshire film it's brilliant if you want to show any element of heat through it um obviously with the help of a bit of heat haze but it does also then cast these very strong shadows um a very big contrast and an immediate contrast between light and dark it can sometimes be difficult to film in um not necessarily always the best light to show off your subject matter whether that be plant, insect, uh, mammal or bird in the best light if you like. But I'm not saying don't ever use that, I do and it has its purposes for sure. The third category, the final category is the overcast days, I like to call it the light box days because it does afford you like a, a huge sky full light box where everything is evenly lit. Um, I know a lot of photographers uh, outside of the wildlife sphere love that kind of light as do cinematographers um, but I think in our particular character category uh, of wildlife photographers and cinematographers we tend to err towards a more acute angle light we tend to like that, that front on light I do though and I'm learning to love more that overcast daylight um, you can get a lot out of it uh, it does solve a lot of problems very quickly so that aside those three main categories aside Let's now start to look at some of the clips and my particular, funny particular, little ways I have about approaching light and the things I like um, to use light in or the conditions that I like to use light in. Never shoot into light, as the old adage says, and of course that myth has been busted for an eternity now. If you never did, you'd never have the beautiful silhouettes or the amazing halo effects. Of a backlit subject and nor would you get this wonderful caramel iridescence coming through a cormorant's primary feathers. And presently I like the cold effect of the low level light better offset behind a wood with barren branches. I also like the low level light that's warmer prior to midwinter's day, so the autumn season leading into winter. Obviously probably down to the myriad of hues of yellows and browns and reds. But beyond the simple effect of this low level light and the nuances of the colour of the vegetation, it's also this time of the year I look for mist and fog. 
This can add a magical incandescent effect to the light. And this I was determined to use on a trip a few years ago to Florida. Outside of the regularity of thunderstorms in the evening, there's always a morning mist in this humid, rich environment. And whilst it might look flat before the sunrise, or when the sun does rise, everything changes. Suddenly, caramels and creams and incredible seepy effects surround you. And during my short time there, I was determined to see if I could catch any element of wildlife in the midst of this mist. And on my third attempt, my luck was in. My path crossed with a white-tailed doe. And above and beyond pressing record, the rest of this clip I can purely thank to the light and the mist. It remains one of my favourite pieces of footage. Sadly, the mist relents pretty quickly, but during the low light, I was still able to catch some of the other more enigmatic species of the Florida marshes. Argiopa ranchia, or as it's commonly known, the yellow garden spider. This, a female, and measuring a full three inches across, but the key element was the other side of her web, where I knew that every thread hung dazzling jewels, courtesy of that mist. The subtlest hint in the spectrum leading beautifully right up to the subject. And then the wonderful harp string effect as the breeze catches the whip. My relationship with light, mist and fog has been ongoing for years and this particular effort with my drone was late last year. This was freezing fog, and there was an element of worry about the water vapour getting into the circuitry or to the motor, but I really wanted to film the dynamic, the contrast of the grey, freezing element into the powerful, warm sunshine, which I knew was only a few metres above me. One thing I wasn't counting on was the movement of goals across the top of this low cloud base. I just added a bit more magic and on my third attempt I managed to get the shot which for me defined the whole morning. One of my earliest projects using mist was for a water vole film I did for Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. And though it didn't persist long, it gave a wonderful ethereal effect to the whole occasion.
another climate driven effect on light which I like to harness whenever I can is that of stormy skies especially those where you know it's going to be interspersed with sunlight and beyond the biblical rays it creates it also spotlights areas of land which if you're lucky enough to get a subject in will then give an amazing backdrop against dark stormy skies and creates a whole piece of footage and a dynamic that you simply couldn't get any other way. On this particular occasion I was lucky enough to get this territorial white throat. On the same occasion and sadly after the direct spotlight had dipped away a little I managed to find this young rabbit but still because of the stormy skies and that slither of light I was really pleased with the effect of the reflections on its eyes. So as much as I love this low level light, I do like it when it, it emits through things, whether that be a meteorological element like a mist or fog. I also like it to be through trees and branches and reed beds. It allows you to lighten the interior and give you so much more depth and texture and also gives you a wonderful insight to anything that may be attempting to hide within. because I knew there would be variable sunshine on a windy day, I had it down to the wood. This would be a game of colours and silhouettes and movement and shadow. With the only hope that I could be stealthy enough or lucky enough to find a subject to put inside this frame. My initial hope was for the local Jay, but he seemed determined to spend the morning evading me. Just then, as is often the case, a new subject arrived and filled the frame perfectly. Wonderful contrasts of bark being lit and bark there's not, and a bird coming in and out of direct low sunshine, revealing him in his early breeding plumage finery. I don't think I've seen a nuthatch look better, and that was all down to the environment and the light.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was interesting to some of you. These are things I've learnt over the last few years with regards to light. I do absolutely adore light. I suppose any cameraman worth his salt has to adore light. That's pretty much it for vlog 12, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. That said about all these aspects, these artistic aspects, these creative aspects of light, I am going to leave you with two very gratuitous, full-on flank-lit clips of uh, two birds at Brandon Marsh at sunrise, this time pretty much the day last year. Couldn't get there this year. Something to do with excess water. Don't know what that's about. So I hope you enjoy these two clips now of Siskins and coming up initially, a golden eye. But until vlog 13, just need them to say goodbye.